Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. My name is Mindy Mandel, and I am here with Jacob and Jed. And together, we're going to be reading through Plato's Ion. So we're using the Loeb translation, and uh, this is the uh, Walter Lamb. Was it Walter Lamb or Harold Fowler? Sorry, I'm not sure who the translator is. But anyway, it's the, the Loeb translation. And for those of you who don't have the physical book, there is a link in the description box for a PDF version of the text. And so with that said, let me jump over to the text. So this is a rather short dialogue, but there's quite a bit here, and I think we'll have a lot to discuss as we go through this. And so we're going to meet Ion, who is a rhapsode, which means that he recites Homer. And he just won a competition, and he's going to be talking to Socrates about his art. I do want to say, just as an introductory note here, just as a side note, I should say, um, that art is a main uh, focus of this dialogue, but they're not necessarily using the word in the same way it's been used in other dialogues. Um, a main focus of art in some other dialogues, such as the Republic, is that an art has to benefit the recipient, such as a doctor's art is for the benefit of the patient. That's not really a focus here. And so we want to try to put aside whatever assumptions we're bringing to what we think Plato means by art and see how he's using the word here. Okay. Um, so with that said, we can jump right into it. Uh, my voice is a little scratchy today, so if you two don't mind, could you read the text? And I'll just jump in frequently, actually, and, and make comments, and uh, we'll have some discussion. So who would like to be Socrates and who Ion? Any preference? I would like to be Ion to gain all of the wisdom from Jacob. <laughs> Are you okay with that, Jacob? Okay. 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 All right. Thank you. So whenever you're ready. Welcome, Ion. Where have you come from now to pay us this visit? From your home in Ephesus? No, no, Socrates. From Epidorus and the festival there of Asclepius. Do you mean to say that Epidorians honor the god with a contest of rhapsodies also? Certainly, and of music in general. Why then you were competing in some contest, were you? And how went your competition? We carried off the first prize, Socrates. Well done. So now, mind that we win two at the Panathenia. At the Panathenia, why, we shall, God willing. Good. I'm going to pause here for a moment because two important names were brought up. First, who is Asclepius? Is he the, uh, I remember at the end of the Phaedo, mm -hmm. it says sacrifice a, co a cock to yes. Asclepius. So he must be Good. the god of medicine. Exactly. Yes, he's the son of Apollo. He's a demigod and the father of medicine. So there's something about this. Fe so for Plato to use this, there may have been some historical truth to it, but it's awfully convenient. And so, you know, there's a lot of, I think, literary license in these dialogues, even though there is something historically true about them. And Asclepius being the um, mythological father of medicine means there's something about healing involved with whenever his name is brought up there's something about healing and healing the soul is what's more important to plato than healing the body and so we're looking for a healing which raises the question if this is in the introduction the very first festival mentioned then we want to keep in mind throughout is ion healed so we're going to look at the end you know was he healed 
and he won a prize there. And by the way, music, I think most people know, know this, but music for the ancient Greeks was much broader than the way we use the word now. It's all literature. It's a much wider. So it includes the writings of Homer and Hesiod and the kind of work that Ion does as a rhapsode. So now he's going to go on to another competition, the Panathenaea. And this was like the biggest festival in the ancient world. And it was in honor of the god Athena. Who's Athena? Surely one of you, you've heard the name Athena before. I've heard of it, but I, I think of like Disney's Hercules. Okay. <laughs> Athena, so I, I don't have a specific... Uh, Jed, do you know, know who what... Athena is? Was she the goddess of wisdom that burst forth from Zeus's forehead in full armor? Exactly. Yes, that's Athena. So also the yes. goddess of war or something, maybe? Um, she, there is a war aspect to her, but most closely she's associated with wisdom. And so there's something about a healing that I passed the first step of some sort of healing, and maybe this dialogue we can guess is some sort of healing. And Socrates, I don't know if this is how much they would read into this, but Socrates considered himself in some other dialogues, such as the Phaedo that was mentioned earlier. He talked about being a follower of Apollo. And Apollo is the father of Asclepius. So, um, we're going to see here that Socrates is going to be trying to continue the healing of Ion, taking him another step. And maybe, and he says, um, and notice it's Socrates who says, maybe we'll win too at the Panathenaea. Maybe we'll move on in your healing to win the festival of the goddess of wisdom. So you can see those connections there. And then Ion says, um, so we shall God willing. As if it's not his own effort, it's just God's will, right? Wait, the God of Athena? Which God willing? Perhaps it's God. Yeah, he doesn't say which God, but perhaps it's Athena. Hmm. Oh. And he's, there's a lot of use of the word we in there. Sorry to I cut mm -hmm. you off. Yeah, it's not clear. Um, I've, had, I've heard it suggested that perhaps Socrates had been working with Ion, but there is no other indication of that. And so it's, I think, a little bit of a stretch. We'd have to, it's an assumption, and it's kind of a jump, because usually if they were working together, there'd be some sentence that's expressly stated that. So it may be more of just um, the kind of camaraderie that Socrates likes to build with the people he's talking to. You know, we're on the same side, we're friends, let's take that tone into our discussion. Right. But it is kind of an open-ended question there of why the we. Ion also says, we carried off. Mm. And I believe that Ephesus was under the control of Athens at this time. And so it may just mean that we are country, like the way in the Olympics you, you represent a certain area of the world. So it may be that sense. Right. So he was mm -hmm. Athenian like Socrates, but he's mm -hmm. come by way of another town. Is that a non-Greek town? I mean, I wish I could answer that more clearly. I'm not really sure. I think it's still Greek, but um, because of wars and borders changing, different areas were under control of different places at different times. And uh, one comment I read was that Ephesus was under the control of Athens at this time. And so that may be the reference to the we. Right, yeah. So I'm wondering I if... Think... I assume the, they're speaking the same language. You're right. So I'm yeah. <laughs> wondering if he, by he's saying, are you from a shared like place of philosophy? Mm. Oh, no, mm. Socrates, I've come from somewhere else. In other words, mm. maybe he's strayed mm. 
Is, is there another significance that you know of and uh, of the places that he mentioned? Mm. No, no. Can we gain um, anything? I think that it's historically accurate, sorry, that Ephesus is where Ion is from, and that's why it's there. And maybe the festival for Asclepius really was in a place called Epidaurus. And, and, that's and that's mm -hmm. sorry to ask a million questions and we're only like a couple of phrases. I'm sorry, in. I can't answer that well. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, are we, should we carry anything with us from the fact that Socrates knows about where he's from? Um, maybe that they're friends, that they know each other. I don't think there's any other significance of the place of Ephesus that, that I'm aware of. I'm wondering about the Theotetus and how he um, he said, was it the Theotetus where he said he's been keeping an eye on him from his youth? No, that was, um, what's that guy's name? Um, Alcibiades. Alcibiades. Alcibiades, of course. Yeah, yeah, I wonder in the same way he, he, he said, oh, I know you, I kept an eye on you. Um, mm -hmm. Eye on you, ha, huh, huh. ha. Um, maybe he's kept an eye on eye on, and that's why he knows where he's um, from. Maybe, maybe he recognizes Ion, something Ion. great about him. Mm. Um, if he'd been watching him in that way, it would be, I think, included in the text. Right. So I'm I'm hypothesizing perhaps that he doesn't mm. didn't keep as sharp an eye on eye on, but he mm. was familiar enough with him to to stay informed about him yeah i would say though that in most dialogues socrates does seem to know where people are from and who their father is and that sort of thing so that's the way i think that they identified the people around them right like right. i like maybe there are many people named ion so he's ion of Ephesus. That's often like, at least in modern times, that's how we refer to different people, like where they're from in addition to their name. And it seems like from the way Socrates greets people, that seems to be something that was significant. Who's your father or who's, or if your mother was from a important family, who is your mother or where are you from? So I, I wouldn't read too much into that, but it is possible that there is something there. Yeah, I generally don't come to Plato from that academic kind of study um, perspective. And so I'm afraid I don't know as much about that sort of background as some people do. But I think if it is something significant, there's probably research on it and you can probably find that on the Internet. Yeah, I'm just wondering about, uh, mm -hmm. was it the last one we read or the one before, how Socrates mm -hmm. came back from war and his first question was, mm -hmm. Who's the guys who've got like skill and aptitude in philosophy? Mm -hmm. And even at the start of the um, Alcibiades, he said, you've got a lot of um, phronesis. I like mm -hmm. that magical Greek word that I don't quite understand mm -hmm. yet. And he said, you've got mega phronesis and you've put off other people who have like super phronesis. And mm -hmm. so um, it seems like Socrates does have some sort of ability to recognize aptitude mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. um or possibility or potential within and he looks for that sort of thing in people as well mm -hmm. right so i agree yeah and so we can keep that in the back of our minds and look at and as we go ahead we'll see if ion is one of those people who has great aptitude or not because he talks to both types so Let's jump back into the text here, where Socrates is going to respond. So Ion had said, why so we shall, God willing? I must say, I have often invited your rhapsodies, Ion, for your art. For besides that it is fitting to your art that your person should be adorned and that you should look as handsome as possible, the necessity of being conversant with a number of good poets, and especially with Homer, the best and divinest poet of all, 
and of apprehending his thought and not merely learning off his words is a matter for envy, since a man can never be a good rhapsody without understanding what the poet says. For the rhapsody ought to make himself an interpreter of the poet's thought to his audience, and to do this properly without knowing what the poet means is impossible. So one cannot but envy all this. We pause here for a moment because what we're seeing here is that to be a good rhapsode is more than just to recite the words of Homer. You have to understand it. So that's a key. And back here, you mentioned the word art. So here's where it was first introduced to us, the idea of art. And we have to pull together what he means by art because he's never going to directly define it. But we can see by the way he talks about it, what he is implying about it. And so the first thing he tells us about art is that the rhapsode has to understand what the poet says, what Homer or Hesiod, whoever is the focus of that rhapsode's work. So I think Homer was the um, main focus of the rhapsodes, but also Hesiod was a very popular one, and there may have been some others as well. Okay, so that's the first thing. I'm going to go a little bit further, and then I want to talk a little bit more about Homer's role in society at this time. Can I ask a, a great question? He also says, uh, not just understand, but apprehend the thought. In the Greek, is thought the word noose? I will try to find. Um, where was that? In Sorry to put you on the spot. Oh, in, interpreter. So you mean interpreter of the poet's thoughts? The best and divinest of all, and of apprehending his thought and not merely learning oh, okay. of his words. Um, hmm. Yeah, he does repeat it again, interpreter oh, of the yeah. poet's thought. Oh, a, oh, do you know he's understanding? Um, oh, that's the divinest. I can see the word divine in there. I'm not sure what word he's using. I'm not seeing noose jumping out at me here. Um, hmm. Sorry, I don't know what word he's using there. Um, if anybody watching this does read Greek, is studying Greek, maybe you can answer Jed's question. We'd really appreciate that, and you can put that in the comment section. Um, I am not seeing the word noose jumping out at me here. So I'm not sure what word he's using. Because I'm wondering, only because I'm, there seems to be like a pattern where he's going from um, interpretation to understanding mm -hmm. which we mentioned but then apprehending the thought mm -hmm. and then um knowing what the poet means mm -hmm. um might signify a movement up that divided line from book six in the republic from interpretation mm -hmm. to understanding and if apprehending of thought is something to do with noose or meaning of the mind Maybe it's another, uh, like a, f an even greater jump from understanding to knowing. Well, apprehending here comes first. So it sounds like maybe that's just the level of, um, under just like the level of belief. If it was following that pattern, this would have to be at the level of belief. So just, this is what this person teaches. That's like the basic level of education, right? It's just learning this is what the person says. And so you just have that basic belief of this person says this and this person says that. You don't have to understand it. And then the next step is the understanding, which is here. Uh, highlighter's not working right. Okay, never mind. Um, so the understanding is here and then knowing is here. Hmm. Interesting. Okay, but that was a good point. Thank you for bringing that up. 
Okay, so ion. Next slide. That's me. Hmm. What you say is true, Socrates. I, at any rate, have found this the most laborious part of my art, and I consider I speak about Homer better than anybody, for neither Metrodorus of Lampsicus nor Steambrotus of Thassos nor Glaucon nor any one that the world has ever seen had so many and such fine comments to offer on Homer as I have. That is good news, Ion, for obviously you will not grudge me in an exhibition of them. And indeed, it is worth listening. Uh, sorry, worth hearing, Socrates, how well I have embellished Homer so that I think I deserve to be crowned with the golden crown by the Homer I die. Good, thank you. And uh, by the way, I apologize on behalf of the whole Greek world for all those difficult names. Um, but here we see again that, that what he does is he embellishes Homer. So he's not just reciting. If he's embellishing, it means there's, what, interpretation, right? He's interpreting Homer. Now, I think it's important to try to put this in context because the way we read Homer today is very different from the way the ancient Greeks read it. These days, Homer is taught in high school and maybe liberal arts colleges. Um, but it was very different in the ancient Greek world. I don't know how familiar either of you are with this, so I wonder what book today would be comparable to the role that the Iliad or the Odyssey held for the ancient Greeks. I want to say, like, the Bible, but maybe not to that extent? Yeah. No, that's okay, okay. Yes. Okay, yeah. That was the good book of the day, was Homer's. So a person who, in front of a crowd, interprets the good book, what would we call this person today? Priest. Yes, exactly. So Pastor, the role that evangelist. Ion is playing... I'm sorry? I was thinking of those evangelists mm. in the big congregations as mega churches and in the mega bucks. <laughs> right. Then actually we'll have to see, you know, is he making money or not? Because that could be part of it as well. But his role, like when we read this, I think as a modern reader, he's reciting Homer. He sounds like an actor or maybe like a university professor because Homer is read in liberal arts colleges. But in the ancient Greek world, he's something closer to a preacher or maybe one of those... Um, Mega church. Uh, what, do, what are they called? Pastors? Hmm. Yeah, maybe something like that. Okay, so that's more his role. And so I think it's important to keep that in mind as we're reading this to understand what role he's playing. Okay, so that's his role. And the Homoderidae, whatever they're called, they were the followers of Homer, basically, a group that followed Homer. So we would be the Mindyadere Day. So. We're Platonists. <laughs> okay, so um, so he suggests that uh, he could um, entertain Socrates very well, and Socrates' reply. Yes, and I must find myself leisure some time to listen to you. But for the moment, please answer this little question. Are you skilled in Homer only or in Hesiod and Archelaus as well? No, no, not only Homer, for that seems... No, sorry. F only in Homer, for that seems 
to me quite enough. And is there anything on which Homer and Hesiod both say the same? Yes, yeah, so I think there are many such cases. Then in those cases, would you expound better what Homer says than what Hesiod says? I should do it equally well in those cases, Socrates, where they say the same. But what of those where they do not say the same? For example, about the seer's art, on which both Homer and Hesiod say something. Quite so. Well then, would you or one of the good seers expound better what these two poets say, not only alike, but differently? about the seer's art. One of the seers would. And if you were a seer, would you not, with an ability to expound what they say in agreement, know also how to expound the points on which they differ? Of course. Then how is it that you are skilled in Homer and not in Hesiod or the other poets? Does Homer speak of any other than the very things that all the other sp poets speak of? Has he not described war for the most part and the mutual intercourse of man, good and bad, lay and professional, and the ways of the gods in their intercourse with each other and with men and happenings in the heavens and in the underworld and origins of gods and heroes are not these the subjects of homer's poetry what you say is true socrates and what of the other poets do they not treat of the same things Yes, but Socrates, not on Homer's level. What? In a worse way? Far, far worse. And Homer in a better. A better indeed, I can assure you. Well now, Ion, dear soul, when several people are talking about number and one of them speaks better than the rest, I suppose there is someone who will distinguish the good speaker. I agree. And will this someone be the same as he who can distinguish the bad speakers, or different? The same, I suppose. And he will be the man who has the art of numeration. Yes. And again, when several are talking about what kinds of food are wholesome and one of them speaks better than the rest, will it be for two different persons to distinguish the superiority of the best speaker and the inferiority of, the, of a worse one, or Obviously. for the same? Obviously, I should say, for the same. Who is he? What is his name? A doctor. And so, we may state, in general terms, that the same person will always distinguish, given the same subject and several persons talking about it, both who speaks well and who, sp and who badly. Otherwise, if he is not going to distinguish the bad speaker, Clearly, he will not distinguish the good one either, where the subject is the same. That is so. And the same man is found to be skilled in both? Yes. And you say that Homer and the other poets, among whom are Hesiod and Archelaus, all speak about the same things, only not similarly but the one does it well, and the rest worse. 
yes. And what I say is true. And since you distinguish the good speaker, you could distinguish also the inferiority of the worst speakers. So it would seem. Then, my excellent friend, we shall not be wrong in saying that our Ion is equally skilled in Homer and in the other poets, seeing that you yourself admit that the same man will be a competent judge of all who speak on the same things, and that practically all the poets treat of the same things. Then what can be the reason, Socrates, why I pay no attention when someone discusses any other poet? And I'm unable to offer any remark at all of any value, but simply drop into a doze. Whereas, if anyone mentions something connected with Homer, I wake up at once, and attend, and have plenty to say. That is not difficult to guess, my good friend. Anyone can see that you are unable to speak on Homer with art and knowledge. For if you could do it with art, you could speak on all the other poets as well, since there is an art of poetry, I take it, as a whole, is there not? Yes. And when one has acquired any other art, whatever, as a whole, the same principle of inquiry holds through all the arts. Do you require some explanation from me, Ion, of what I mean by this? Yes, upon my word, Socrates, I do. For I do enjoy listening to you wise men. I only wish you were right there, Ion. But surely it is you rhapsodies and actors and the men whose poems you chant who are wise, whereas I speak but the plain truth as a simple layman might. For in regard to this question I asked you just now, observe what a trifling commonplace it was that I uttered, a thing that any man might know, namely, that when one has acquired a whole art, the inquiry is the same. Let us just think it out thus. There is an art of painting as a whole. Yes. And there are and have been many painters, good and bad. Certainly. Now, have you ever found anybody who is skilled in pointing out the successes and failures among the works of Polynotus, son of Apollophon, but unable to do so with the works of the other painters, and who, when the works of the other painters are exhibited, drops into a doze and is at a loss and has no remark to offer. But when he has to pronounce upon Polynotus or any other painter you please, and on that one only, wakes up and attends and has plenty to say. No, on my honor, I certainly have not. Or again, in sculpture, have you ever found anyone who is skilled in expounding the successes of Daedalus, son of Meton? or Epius, son of Panopius, or Theodorus of Samos, or any other single sculptor, but in face of the works of the other sculptors, is at a loss and dozes, having nothing to say. No, on my honor, I have not found such a man as that either. But further... I expect you have also failed to find one in fluting or harping or minstrelies or rhapsodying who is skilled in expounding the art of Olympus or Thramier 
Thamorus or Orpheus or Themis. The rhapsody of Atia, but is at a loss and has no remark to offer on the successes or failures in rhapsody of Ion of Ephesus. Hmm. I cannot gainsay you on that, Socrates. But of one thing I am conscious in myself, that I excel all men in speaking of Homer and have plenty to say. And everyone else says I do it quite well. But on others, I am not a good speaker. Yet now... Observe what that means. Okay, let's pause here for a moment. So he told Ion that he is unable to speak on Homer with art and knowledge. And so then we have to see what he means by art. So we already saw the idea that you have to understand what the poet had said. And now they go on to talk more about art, and he says that when one has acquired a whole art, the inquiry is the same. And so then he can look at other arts as examples, but we can pull what he says about them. It's not like there's a different set of rules that he's going to make about painters than sculptors, because he just says here that it's all the same. So we can pull out what he says. And he just gave us three pieces of the puzzle, right? The first piece was being skilled in pointing out successes and failures. Which, and also actually to tie this back to what Jed was bringing up earlier, where there were like maybe three levels of belief, understanding, and knowing, we may see that here, like this may be pointing to that lowest level where you can just simply point out this was good, this is bad, this was successful, this was a failure. In the next step, you're expounding the successes. So this may match to the idea of understanding. In the third one here, then now you're looking at... Um, Olympus, it says here, as a mythical inventor of music, and Orpheus is considered a, a bard, like the very best of his field, and there is actually like a whole mystery school built around Orpheus, and he's also a mythical um, person, and then this um, Femius is a minstrel who was forced to sing to the suitors of Penelope in the Odyssey, so these are not real people. So they are more like paradigms. To know the paradigm is a higher skill than to expound the successes of these artists. And actually, Daedalus is also not a real figure. He's the one, he's the mythical painter whose paintings were, or, or sorry, sculptor, whose, sculpts, whose sculptures were so lifelike that they moved. Uh, may have been, I wonder, was it a real person? I'm not sure. But um, there's another level there, right? So we're getting these levels of art. So when we pull it all together, what, so far, what does Socrates mean by art? What are you seeing here, Jacob? Hmm. Heart hard for me to say i i would think maybe it's uh just like a full like an actual understanding that's not like it's not like sophistry or it's like not it's not flattery it's like actually you know yeah not to just repeat what you said but like like understanding the paradigm mm -hmm. behind that mm -hmm. you know work mm -hmm. good yeah and Jed, anything you want to add? Only that it reflects strongly back on what we just were reading about holiness. Mm. Um, 
to be able to expound upon it in court or or in front of the courthouse with Socrates. But also a lot of our conversation was about, uh, is there a paradigm and you're not just imitating or following an example? Um, yeah, so that's interesting. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it seems like those three higher cognitive functions are, mm -hmm. are necessary. Mm. And also he mentioned meaning earlier. So you had to, uh, understand and learn, um, uh, apprehend the thought. But then the final thing he said, I don't know if this is a, another, another level, but he said, know the meaning mm -hmm. of the poet, the, the meaning of the mind, which, mm -hmm which is interesting because it's not just his understanding. It's not just knowing his mind, but knowing the meaning of the mind of the poet, which would put the poet himself within a larger paradigm of minds that have unfolded through human history. And so that last section that you pointed out that these guys are, are mythological like and in mythology the birth of these minds come forward as parts or aspects of a greater whole to tell a bigger picture which is is fascinating and i'm trying to think of a analogy i can grasp with with music um like uh, being able to understand why Radiohead is good and explain that and um, and why they're different from Metallica. <laughs> um, but to be able to grasp the mind of... Um, of um, oh, God, this is embarrassing. Um, Tom York. And from where all of the Radiohead music unfolds, but then the meaning of Tom York within the greater scope of music is, is even, even higher level still. And the meaning of his mind against other artists from other fields, like um, th I think in that last section, were they different artists from different arts? Mm. Yeah, that's, that's right like... Yeah. Um, let's see. Second. Yeah. Um, okay. This guy was a sculptor, this Daedalus, and Epius was actually the person who made the Trojan horse, the wooden horse. Mm. Wow. Wow. Um, Theodorus. It says here is a metal worker. Well, they... yeah. Daedalus, I believe, was a mythical person also but the other two perhaps are real people well that's an even higher level they're not just grasping <laughs> not just grasping the mind of socrates um but grasping the meaning of him relative to all minds that unfold throughout the unfolding of human destiny well they're expounding the successes of those artists yeah. right i i'm i'm tying all this into um yeah. Uh, uh, the meaning of the mind or meaning of, mm. yeah. Mm. Yeah, well, you may have offended some Metallica fans, but your point's well taken. And another thing that maybe adds to what you both have said. Metallica's um, great. <laughs> Metallica rocks. Metallica rules. <laughs> but they're different than Radiohead, and I can expound why. And I uh, just want to point out one other thing here that I think is kind of curious. In our modern age, when we think of an artist, we think of the painter, the sculptor, the poet. What he's describing here, what defines the art, is being able to understand the artist, expound their successes, expounding the art in a more general sense, the paradigm of art. Even the earlier one, pointing out the successes and failures. It's the critic. Maybe these very same people also do the art of painting, or in our modern age of art, we also do the activity, maybe I should say, of painting or sculpting or so on. It can, it's not really clear here that it has to be a different person, 
But what he's defining as having the art is being the critic and being the one who understands it and can open it up and knows the paradigm. And so it's a very curious definition of art, right? And it looks like Jed has something to add. Well, I was wondering if if it was fair to add that final meaning of the mind that the critic not would not just know the paradigm, but apprehend the paradigm relative to other paradigms within a greater whole. Um, that would be a very impressive person, but um, I don't know that it's necessary to function at that high of a level to fit this definition of having this particular art. Right, but right. if you're able yeah. to expound on the paradigm of sculpting mm -hmm. and also music mm -hmm. and also um, uh, metalwork and painting, would they mm -hmm. be several different paradigms? Well, he says back here that when one has acquired a whole art, the inquiry is the same. Or there's another one here. We may state in general terms that the same person will always distinguish, given the same subject and several persons talking about it, both who speaks well and who badly. Otherwise, he's not going to distinguish the bad speaker. Clearly, he will not distinguish the good one either, where the subject is the same. Um, idea of a whole art um it's the sense i got from this is that um the rules that he's point that he's laying out for these different arts are the same um i, I got your question it's not really clear to me if he's which way he's going Mm, yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah, it does seem like he's saying if the subject is the same, and he uses, uh, if oh, Homer's talking about seeing, so wouldn't the seer be the expert? But mm -hmm. then when he goes through those three um, examples, mm -hmm. the final one seems to have people who have different subjects together, mm -hmm. and he's saying someone to be able to talk about all of them. So I wonder if that's going oh, from understanding. Yeah, I think the art would be painting or sculpting. Or he's going to expand it as we go on in the in the book talking yeah, he talked about the seer already. He's going to bring in the doctor and um the military general and that sort of thing. So he's going to expand it very much. To to know the art yeah, actually, the more I'm thinking about it, I think to know the art is just the one art that you're talking about. The same basic rules apply in general to what it means to have knowledge of an art, but it doesn't mean that you necessarily know all the arts. Right. right. Okay. Which is the puzzling thing of that last example where mm -hmm. he does l a lump together one person being able to ex to talk about different arts, different, not no, different um, uh, mythological paradigms of different mm -hmm. arts. So mm -hmm. I'm wondering if that is that greater mm -hmm. whole of all of the arts that that third mm -hmm. person has. Because mm -hmm. that would be the one that yeah. you'd want. <laughs> Yeah, to be to have the knowledge of art in general, you can maybe say something about other arts, about specific arts, but it doesn't mean that you're necessarily an expert on that art. I would say. Hmm. Interesting. Like, uh, I guess if you are able to apprehend the paradigm of pure music, you'd be able to expand expound upon different musicians. But then if you were able to see that paradigm and the paradigm of sculpting and the paradigm of, of painting, and you doesn't matter what kind of a party you'd be invited to, you'd be able to point and say, oh, this one's better and this one's, this is why. Perhaps. That would be amazing. Because then I wonder if you would have a hierarchy of different paradigms, if the paradigm of painting might be greater than music for example, or sculpting being three-dimensional maybe is 
a, a, a more significant or greater paradigm than yeah. than painting. I don't see anything here that puts these various arts that he's mentioned here in a hierarchy, suggesting that fluting is higher than harping or vice versa. I don't see anything of that. But in general, Plato considers philosophy the highest art. So there is a hierarchy of sorts. But maybe these particular arts that he's talking about here all go together. Right. And and also the way that he's talking about judging who is better and who is worse implies mm -hmm. there would be a hierarchy within the arts. Sure. I'm not going to offend Metallica or Radiohead fans, but you'd be able to rank one above the other for a reason. Maybe and Mozart then... is at the top. <laughs> or Beethoven. Or... Mozart, oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> Can't go wrong with those two. <laughs> but then we could say, yeah. well, I wonder if the paradigms, or if maybe those arts are on a level, and then there's, a, because obviously philosophy might be high, but even the Ion's art might if if that if what Ion's doing as a rhapsody, does that rank higher than music or sculpting, and does mm. it rank lower than philosophy, in terms of the paradigms? Mm. There's yeah. a, I I don't know which dialogue it's from, but I think there's a part uh, where Plato says that like higher souls are like mm. the type of, that were going to be like philosophers or musicians yeah. or yeah. or lovers, yeah. Yeah, so I I'd say maybe music is up there. Maybe yeah, I don't remember above, the full uh, order of them, but yeah, depending on how good of a look, there's a myth where like people their souls can go up and get a glimpse of heaven, and those that get the long goes that only have like a small glimpse may come back as tyrants or some lowly life form, whereas those who take a good look are going to be philosophers and lovers and artists and musicians and and there is a text where he talks about i think uh in the re about reincarnation and he talks i can't remember the text but it was about uh how you relate to your lover and the sort of god you're reaching for and he lists like um i think eight or nine different You'll come back as a philosopher, or you come back as a king, or you come back as a, mm -hmm. um, a, a magician, uh, or a priest, and you'll come back as a musician, mm -hmm. or you'll come back. And he had like a list of like eight or nine. Yeah, that's the Phaedrus. That's the Phaedrus. Interesting, because that that establishes a hierarchy of different mm -hmm. arts. Right. Yes, but as for the different arts that are named here. Fluting, harping, minstrelsy. Um, there's no hierarchy given here. I think, and even in the Phaedrus, I think they're all just grouped together under music. Mm. Okay. Um, well, I think we can maybe read just a little bit further. Ayon, when you're ready. Oh. Oh, sorry. We're at that line. Sorry. Um, observe what I mean. Okay, so sorry. So it ended with um, Ion saying that um, when he speaks on Homer, he has a lot to say, but no one else. And he says, yet now observe what that means. I do observe it, Ion. And I am going to point out to you what I take it to mean. For as I was saying just now, this is not an art in you, whereby you speak well on Homer, but a divine power, which moves you like that in the stone, which Euripides, Euripides <laughs> named a magnet, but most people call Heraclea stone. For this stone not only attracts iron rings, but also imparts the imparts to them a power whereby they in turn are able to do the very same thing as the stone and attract other rings so that sometimes there is formed quite a long chain of bits of iron and rings 
suspended one from another, and they all depend for this power on that one stone. In the same manner also, the muse inspires men herself, and then, by means of these inspired persons, the inspiration spreads to others and holds them in a connected chain. For all the good epic poets utter all those fine poems, not from art, but as inspired and possessed, and the good lyric poets, poets likewise, just as the Corabanthian worshippers do not dance when in their senses, so the lyric poets do not indict those fine songs in their senses, but when they have started on the melody and rhythm, they begin to be frantic, and it is under possession, as the Bacchants are possessed, and not in their senses when they draw honey and milk from the rivers, that the soul of the lyre, or sorry, that the soul of the lyric poets does the same thing by their own report. For the poets tell us, I believe, that the songs they bring us are the sweets they cull from honey dropping fonts in certain gardens and glades of the muses. Like the bees and winging the air as these do, and what they tell is true, for a poet is a light and winged and sacred thing, and is unable ever to indict until he has been inspired and put out of his senses, and his mind is no longer in him. Every man, whilst he retains possession of that, is powerless to indict a verse or chant an oracle. Seeing then that it is not by art that they compose and utter so many fine things about the deeds of men, as you do about Homer, but by a divine dispensation, each is able only to compose that to which the muse has stirred him. This man diathribes another laudatory odes, another dance songs, and another epic, or else iambic, uh, iambic verse. But each is at fault in any other kind, for not by art do they utter these things, but by divine influence. Since, if they had fully learnt by art to speak of one kind of theme, they would know how to speak on all. For, and for this reason, God takes away the mind of these men and uses them as his ministers, just as he does soothsayers and godly seers, in order that we, do, we who hear them may know that it is not they who utter these words of great price when they are out of their wits, but that it is God himself who speaks and addresses us through them. A convincing proof of what I say is the case of Tynicus, the Chaldean, who had never composed a single poem in his life that could deserve any mention, and then produced the Paeanin, Paeanin, which is in everyone's mouth, almost the finest song we have, simply, as he says himself, an invention of the muses. For the god, as it seems to me, intended him to be a sign to us that we should not waver or doubt that these fine poems are not human or the work of men, but divine and the work of gods, and that the poets are merely the interpreters of the gods, according as each is possessed by one of the heavenly powers, to show this forth the god of set purpose sang the finest of songs through the meanest of poets, 
Or do you not think my statement true, Ion? Thank you for reading that long speech there. That's the first of Socrates' two speeches. And uh, so there he is laying out now the this idea that there is like a uh, magnetic stone. Here. Um, it's a magnet. Most people call it a Herculean, Herculea stone. And it attracts different rings. And so let's be clear on what it attracts. Long chain. Um, he's going to be building this, and I think the whole thing is not yet built. But we got here the first ring here, the idea that there is a divine dispensation that is enjoyed by someone like Homer. The poets are merely the interpreters of the gods. So that magnet would be like the gods, and the first ring that attaches to them would be like the poets. That as we go on, we're going to see then where Ion and others fit in, okay, where there are other rings and where is Ion's ring. But for now, we have just the first ring. And he has an interesting idea here. That God takes away the mind of these men and uses them as his ministers. That it's when we read the works of someone like Homer, then we know there must be a God because where did this brilliance come from? As if the, the, these people couldn't have done it on their own. He mentioned someone named um, Tinicus, who never composed a single poem in his life that could deserve any mention. And then, by divine inspiration, you might say, he came up with a song that's on everybody's mouth. And so there's something divine about these artists. Um, famous line here, a poet is a light and winged and sacred thing. So that's the first step that he's building here. What are your thoughts so far? Is it is it even fair to call them artists anymore? Since for not by art do they utter these things, but mm, by divine right. influence. So right, they're like right. So diviners. these are not the artists. Remember before he was saying that it's having the knowledge, it's the critic. Right. It's the judge, the one who can judge the work, who is who has the art. So yeah, he is not calling these people artists. They don't produce by art. They produce by what he's calling a divine dispensation. Divinity has dispensed something to these people. Yeah, so that's me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it it kind of seems like and I, now, because I'm trying not to like bring in any outside mm -hmm. uh, definition of art to this, but like, mm -hmm. then it's like, you know, uh, it's kind of seeming like science, sciency to me now, where it's mm -hmm. like uh, you're trying to, uh, you know, judge something mm -hmm. via that. So mm -hmm. that's kind of where I'm, what I'm right. thinking. Right. And the question oh, and what the criteria are. And um, in order to really open up then that comparison between science and what he's calling here art, then I think you'd have to pull out the Theotetus and look at like the ideas of knowledge. What is knowledge? Is it something that you can put in a bullet form and say these are the criteria? Or is it something else? And so that would bring in that question. But it is sort of in that direction. We'll just leave it at that. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. And Jed, what are your thoughts? You have the final word. Hmm. We, we were talking about if there could be some sort of um, mega art that 
can speak on any of the different arts and their respective paradigms and judge whether or not this one is good, this one is bad, and why. Mm -hmm. But it seems like Socrates gave a judgment of who was the better poet and talked of a few different poets within that poetry paradigm. Mm -hmm. But also, in that same speech, he spoke in a way that addressed all dancers and songwriters and uh, iambic mm. verse makers. So he does seem to be being a critic that can work within one and judge who is the best and who is the worst, but also to judge all the different mm. creators within all the different paradigms. Mm. And also talk of principles that apply equally to all of them. And so I suppose he could, if he was at a a dance party, he could apply that and say, oh, by the way, this is the best of all dances and this is why. Maybe using that um, magnetic ring and his, knowledge, and his understanding of knowledge and art. Well, now are you putting Socrates as an artist or as a person with divine dispensation? Well, he's able to judge who is the best of the poets. And this mm -hmm. dude here, he's mm -hmm. able to talk of all of the different arts. Mm -hmm. So... I, I would say artist. Mm. So you don't see Socrates as this person being described in this speech, just to be clear. Well, he says that they, t they tend to be one-hit wonders as well. And Socrates has released many bangers that we've read on your channel. <laughs> um, yeah, and anyone he talks to, he seems to like be able to talk about a bunch of different stuff. Mm. Um, yeah, um, he didn't use the example of um, Tinicus, who is, I guess you'd call a one-hit wonder. I don't know if anyone would call Homer or Hesiod one-hit wonders. So it's Definitely. not only um, the one-hit wonders, um, but but yes, he says um, what he does say. What they do all have in common, whether they've continued this their whole life or it just happened once, is that. God takes away the mind of these people and uses them as his ministers. And I think what you're saying is that Socrates is not someone who fits that description. No. And that would also mean that they would not be able to judge the validity of the work they create. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They cannot be the critics. Yeah. Yeah. And, and actually, you do hear many artists say, um, I don't know where this music came from. Oh, it's for sure. Yeah, yeah famously, like, Let It Be from mm -hmm. the Beatles. This oh, came to me in a mm -hmm. dream. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And it's elusive. And then there can be problems and people trying to tr chase that chase that magnet, um, especially if they don't themselves understand mm -hmm. how it is they're doing what they're doing when they have success. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the, the question of what it means to be out of your mind is an issue that's going to come up throughout this dialogue. And you guys mentioned Phaedrus before, and I don't want to go into another dialogue, but I'll just mention briefly that this one introduces the idea, and that later dialogue develops it more. Because there are two sides of it. There's the positive image of like the mystic who's out of their mind. And there's also the more negative view of the person who's crazy. And so we're going to see that as well. What does it mean to be out of your mind? And then maybe I'll just kind of close today's um, talk with maybe just one last point here. That can I, Before we close it, can I ask a final oh, question? Sure. Sure. 
Go ahead. Well, 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 I mean, what you just said, first of all, leads the idea of like, yeah, you can make the most inspiring religious text or song, but wouldn't wouldn't it be better to have both and be able to look at it after? Like that um, saying, um, uh, en vidi veritas, and that, and that, uh, that um, what's the habit that some ancient cultures had of getting wasted out of their minds and creating ideas or laws and then the next day while everyone's sober look at it or vice versa and it has to meet both criteria mm -hmm. so if you had the ability to become divinely inspired to create and you had the critics art to look back on it you could say well i don't want to release this because this is this is not actually going to be good or beneficial mm -hmm. right yeah that's back to that earlier point that's the person he said has the art was the person who can judge. Now, it could be the same person who also paints and who sculpts. And there's nothing that says you can't be both. But you don't have the art unless you can be the judge. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And then there's one line that he said earlier that really stuck out to me. When uh, Ion said, I want to hear because I like listening to wise people. So, which... I mean, there's a, there's a huge dynamic of feeding Ion's ego and calling him mm. my excellent friend and whatever. Um, and, and him not wanting to own up. Oh, yeah, you tell me because I like listening. Not tell me because I'm ignorant. But Socrates' response, I'm, I'm not a wise person. You are. That, is that a lie? Is that, what does that mean? And he says, all I do is speak truth plainly so earlier we spoke of the idea of um true wisdom being an empty vessel like in the theotetus it's the god that's working through me but he does say he's doing something he's speaking the truth mm -hmm. and is that tongue-in-cheek when he says that ion is and his friends are wise Tongue in cheek, or maybe he's using a more colloquial understanding of what it means to be wise. Just as there's like a double edged sword of this question of being out of your mind. Um, some people saw like the sophists, for example, as like the wise people who can talk in very eloquent ways, right? I don't do that, I speak plainly. Right. And so if there is that second, truer definition of wisdom, mm -hmm. maybe speaking plain truth is some sort of uh, way of being the the channel for mm -hmm. true wisdom, mm -hmm. while somehow these creators are able to be a channel of a kind of wisdom mm -hmm. or a kind of uh, inspiring mm -hmm. madness that can inspire mm -hmm. others like a mm -hmm. magnet, mm -hmm. maybe being able to see the truth or speak mm -hmm. the truth or mm -hmm. apprehend the truth or know the meaning of truth, something to do with truth that, that mm -hmm. Socrates is pointing to that allows him to be what we would consider genuinely wise. Right, right, right. So calling um, Ion wise is perhaps a backhanded compliment that Ion didn't pick up on. But... The more significant point that I think you're making is that perhaps Socrates is both the inspired poet and the judge who has the art. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's really um, uh, not nice for us because we are doing a lot of effort into speaking the truth. Like we're looking at the Greek, we're looking at reading it very carefully. This isn't like how we read, like you asked earlier, what uh, would Homer be like in, in our day? And I was thinking, oh, you know, To Kill a Mockingbird or Shakespeare or something like that, that we, that I learned at school. I know that the Bible is the better answer because of the spiritual aspect and how men relate to the gods. But when we read those books in class, we didn't read it with this level of, time and care and reflection and yeah. and uh, specifically in order to see and speak the truth that's what we're putting a lot of effort and it's very different f compared to what i'm used to at school and things right so it's nice that he's saying that 
all I do is speak the truth because that's kind of what we're doing here in your group. That's right. Yeah, certainly. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, why don't we end it there? I think we should stop here because this is a good point, I think, in the text to stop at. And I think that maybe next week we might even be able to wrap it up or get pretty close to the end because it's a very short dialogue. But it's quite dense and we'll see how it goes because there is quite a bit to talk about. So if we find that we have a lot to say, then this may extend another two weeks um, you know, for all of the conversation. But otherwise, maybe we'll wrap it up next week. So we'll kind of play it by air and see how it goes. Okay, so um, those of you watching on YouTube, thank you very much for joining us. And if you do have any questions or comments, you can put those below, or there's also an email address in the description box. And I hope you'll all join us next week. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.